Last day we talked about recombinant DNA and how we use different protocols and techniques and equipment to copy DNA and also to take bits and pieces of DNA and splice them together and create something new. Today we're going to talk more about the applications of that. We'll start off by looking at the applications in forensics and also in paternity and maternity testing. We'll talk about things like DNA fingerprinting. There are regions on chromosomes where we have junk DNA that consists of DNA sequences that are repeated over and over again. The number of repeats differs from person to person. We call these areas variable number tandem repeats. Again, it's because we have this repeated sequence that's repeated a variable number of times. We can use these regions of the chromosomes to identify a suspect in a murder, for instance, or to identify a father if we don't know who the father is. In the past, what you would do is you would take all the DNA from a person, you would cut it up with endonucleases, restriction endonucleases that cut at specific places. You would run all of this DNA through gel electrophoresis and sort it by size. And then you would take that DNA, transfer it to a piece of paper, and then you would add a probe, which is a single-stranded piece of DNA that has a fluorescent label attached to it or a radioactive label, and that would stick to your sequence of DNA, and then you'd look for the different sized pieces. It's easier now. What we do nowadays, typically, is we use PCR. So with PCR, we can amplify or make copies of just this specific region, and then we can see how long it is. Let's take a closer look at how this would work. This is a particular VNTR here, but there are a number of different VNTRs that have different sequences. Again, it's a region where we have a variable number of this specific repeated sequence of DNA. So here we have A, C, A, G, 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 T, G, T, G, 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 G. And this is repeated over and over again. We've got an example here with an individual we're diploid, of course, so we have two copies of all of our chromosomes. That includes two copies of these regions on those chromosomes. So this particular individual at this particular location on the chromosome has 12 copies on one and 17 copies of that repeat on the uh, same area of the homologous chromosome. Here's a variable number tandem repeat, and I'm including the DNA sequence on either side of that repeating sequence of DNA nucleotides. So in the middle there, you can see we have a lot of repeated sequence, but then at the top and bottom, we have these areas that I've highlighted in blue that are the same for everyone. So it doesn't matter how many of the repeated stuff you have in the middle, you have these blue regions and we can make DNA primers that recognize that. So the sequences that are underlined, they will receive the DNA primer that we use during uh, PCR amplification of DNA. So again, we have this sequence in the middle here that's repeated a variable number of times. We have the area in blue on each side of that that's the same in every one. And once again, we can make copies just of this region by using those shared sequences that uh, are underlined in this diagram. Now, how is this useful? Well, let's say that this is your mother's situation when it comes to that particular VNTR. So on one of her chromosomes, she has 24 repeated sequences that's shown in red and yellow. And on the other homologous chromosome, she has 16 repeats. And again, the blue at the ends, that's the part that everyone has. That's the part that we can get our primers to attach to 
during PCR so that we can make copies of this region. And really all we're going to look for is the length of this region. Now let's say your father has this situation. Your father has 37 of those repeats at that location on one chromosome and only 20 on the homologous chromosome. What about you? Well, let's say that you have one chromosome that has 16 copies. That's fine because obviously you could have gotten that from your mother. Remember that your mother and father made haploid gametes, so they only contributed one copy of this location on the chromosome. And let's say that your other homologous chromosome has 37 repeats. Again, that's fine because that definitely could have come from your father. Now, presumably your mother knows that she gave birth to you. Uh, your father has something that matches, so it makes sense that your father is actually your father. Although with this type of paternity testing, we can never actually exclude a parent, but we can show that yes, they're a possible parent. Now let's say instead that you had that 16 or maybe a 24. And then in addition to that, you had a 26. You had a chromosome that had 26 repeats. Well, that couldn't have come from your father. And in that case, that would be very strong evidence that your father is not actually your father. And one more look at how we would do this in PCR. This is a bit more detailed than maybe we need to know. But we know that we have these two primers, primer one and primer two, and we know their length. And those are the uh, underlined sequences of the appropriate color. We know that the primer, the first primer attaches 87 base pairs upstream of uh, where the repeats began. And we know that primer two attaches two base pairs downstream from where the repeats end. We know that the repeats consist of 16 nucleotides and that sequence is repeated over and over again. And we could use this simple little formula here to figure out how many repeats we have. Or in this example, we could just count them. Once we do our PCR, what we do is we run the test on a gel. We do gel electrophoresis and we sort things out by size. Let's take a look at another hypothetical example here. So we have the mother's DNA profile, we have the child's profile, and we have the alleged father's profile. Now in this case we can see that there's one band, so one length of this DNA sequence that could certainly have come from the mother, and there's another band that could certainly have come from the father. So we can't say for sure that the father is the father, but we can't exclude the father. And it, it makes sense that the father would probably be the father in this case, because there are lots of possibilities for the lengths of these bands. Now let's take a look at a second example here where the father is excluded. So again, we have that one band that definitely could have come from the mother, but we have another band that doesn't match anything the father has. And in that case, we can definitely exclude the father. VNTRs are so-called junk DNA. So DNA that doesn't code for anything, we're not really sure if it has a function, but it's useful because we have several different VNTR sequences that have been identified. They're found on set locations on the chromosomes. And again, from person to person, although the sequence of each repeated element is the same, we differ in the number of those repeats. If we want to do a proper test, though, we don't just look at one VNTR, we look at several. So we might look at four or more. And that's what you're seeing here. So we've got the results of a paternity test. So testing for the father to see if the alleged father is actually the father. We've got the mother, M, the child, C, and the father, F. And the first part on the left, we're comparing the child's pattern 
to the mother's pattern. And we can see that half of those bands could indeed have come from the mother. In the second diagram, we're comparing the child to the father, and we can see that the four other bands could indeed have come from the father. Now, because we're using four different locations, the chances of us just going out and grabbing a random man and getting this to match is very low. So it seems pretty conclusive that the father is the father. Here's a second example where that's not the case. So again, we're comparing the child's pattern to the mother's pattern. We do that because we generally always know who the mother is. There's a record of the mother giving birth to this person. So once again, we can see that we can explain half of the bands in the child's profile by looking at the mother's profile. But now when we compare the other bands, the ones that obviously did not come from the mother, they don't actually match who we thought the father was. So the alleged or presumed father in this case is not actually the father. Here's an example where we've got a father and his three children, and they all definitely could have come from that man. We're only looking at one VNTR here. We should, again, look at more if we want to be sure, but the results here do match the father. Now, the one weird thing is that the first child only has one band. Why might that be? Well, that child has two copies that are the same. So for that one VNTR locus or location on the chromosome, they just happen to have two copies that are identical with respect to the number of repeats. So the father gave them a copy with a certain number of repeats. The mother gave them a copy that also had that same number of repeats. And when we do the PCR and run that on a gel, we only see the single band. Let's work together on this example. So we have an example here where we have a mother and father and four children. And we're gonna see if we can tell whether or not this family makes sense genetically or whether someone has been adopted. Again, we're only looking at one VNTR locus here. So let's start with the mother. We have her bands here and here, and we're gonna match that to the children first. So the first child, yep, that works. She could have got the band from the mother. The second child also works. Um, the second child actually could have got either of those two bands from the mother. So this one here or this one down here. And then we've got our third child. We'll skip the father for a moment. And we have a band down here that definitely could have come from the mother. And then the last child, we have a band at the top that could certainly have come from the mother. So next we'll take a look at the father. So we have a band here and we have a band here. Let's take a look at child one. Child one has a band that matches. So for child one now, we have our two bands. We have one from the father and one from the mother. So that, that works, that's good. Now, child two, we have one band that came from the mother, but we have another band that could not have come from the father. The father does not have a band that matches the top one or the bottom one. So the father would be excluded as the biological father of that child. For child three, we're okay. We've got a match here and the lower one came from the mother. And again, for child four, we have a band here that could have come from the father and we have another band that could have come from the mother. So the only one that we have an issue with is 
child two. And again, it's because we have that one band that came from the mother and it could have been either the top one or the bottom one. And then we have another band that came from a different father. This technology has had a huge impact on forensics. So there's a number of old case files that could not be solved back in their day and they have been solved now with the help of VNTRs and also something called STRs, single tandem repeats, which are, are very similar. This man here, for instance, was actually exonerated. So he was charged with murder before this technology existed and then later proved to be innocent. And you can see that the profile we see in his semen does not match what was found on the victim, but it does match what was found on a second suspect. We're gonna change gears a bit now and look at ancient DNA. So can we collect DNA using things like PCR from things that have been extinct for a long time? Can we extract DNA from dinosaurs? The short answer is no. Typically during fossilization, all the organic material is replaced by minerals like silica, for instance. DNA is of course organic and it's also not that stable. It's a fairly delicate molecule. Now we have been able to isolate some proteins from dinosaur fossils, but so far not much in the way of DNA. In the movie Jurassic Park, what they did was they collected dinosaur blood from a mosquito that was preserved in amber. And then they managed to get the entire genome. They had to piece it together, but they got the whole genome and they cloned a dinosaur. Unfortunately, we don't find that much DNA. And unfortunately, amber is not as protective as was once thought. It was once thought that things that were sealed in amber um, might contain DNA that we could collect, but it turns out that amber does allow oxygen in and water and so on, and DNA breaks down. However, though, we have successfully collected large pieces of DNA from organisms that are not quite as old. So if we have things that are well preserved from up to about 100,000 years ago, we can collect DNA. And it's possible when looking at things like woolly mammoths that we might be able to collect a significant portion of the genome. There's been an ongoing project to try to reconstruct um, some extinct Ice Age mammals, including mammoths. So mammoths were furry elephants that went extinct during the last ice age. We only have two species of elephant today, but in the past we had 18 actually, and several went extinct during the last ice age. Some mammoths were very well preserved. They were preserved in permafrost. They were permanently frozen, and we have good hair samples and tissue samples and so on that we can collect DNA from. And the hope is that people will be able to collect bits and pieces, small bits and pieces of DNA using things like PCR, and then take those bits of DNA, look for overlap, and basically rebuild the genome, the entire set of instructions needed to make a mammoth bit by bit. So by overlapping those bits of DNA, so using computers to look for over overlapping sequences, hopefully we can build a brand new sequence. We can rebuild the genome of the mammoth. The idea of the mammoth project was that they would start with African elephant DNA. And as they reconstructed specifically mammoth genes, so genes that were quite different from the living elephant DNA, they would splice those in and they would take their new constructed genomes and put them into uh, unfertilized egg cells and they would serve as a zygote. So basically they would reconstruct as much of the genome as they could 
and then use that to clone a mammoth in an African elephant surrogate. Now there's lots of problems with this because if you're just kind of replacing genes a few at a time, how do you know when you've added enough mammoth DNA to make your elephant actually a mammoth and not some sort of African mammoth hybrid? The other problem is of course, that elephants have a very long gestation period, longer than us. There's a long time between generations. So this is an ongoing, rather slow project at the moment. Moving along, we're gonna have a really quick look at genetic engineering and see if it really is Frankenstein science. Now, when people hear genetic engineering, that conjures up a lot of different ideas. And some of them are misconceptions. People think about stuff like what you see here. Now, maybe not. This is a huge exaggeration, but we're not talking about just taking two creatures and smashing them together and see what happens. It is a little bit more refined than that. Let's have a look at a real example. So this is a rather old one, actually. This is going back to the early 2000s. But we've got a company here, Genzyme, that wanted to produce human antithrombin-3. Human antithrombin-3 is something your body produces that prevents blood from clotting where it shouldn't. So it's an anti-blood clotting factor. This is a compound that's really, really useful in surgery because of course, when you do surgery, you cut into the patient and if you have blood clots developing, they can travel through the patient and cause serious damage. So we want to avoid blood clots. It's difficult to isolate this in large quantities. You can't just go and collect a bunch of human volunteers and drain their blood and collect all of that. You wouldn't get very much and it would be very time consuming and very difficult. So instead, what these researchers did was they took the gene for this anti-blood clotting factor, they put it into a goat. They put it into the goat zygote, but they did it with a particular promoter. Remember, promoters are on-off switches. They took the gene, they stuck it into the zygote. That means that the gene will end up everywhere in the adult goat when it grows up but they put it in attached to a promoter that's only turned on in the milk producing cells. So the cells within the udder that produce the milk will also produce this anti-blood clotting factor. And that means you can just collect the goats. The goats are normal looking. They just have this particular protein in their milk. You can treat them the way you would normal goats. You can collect their milk send the milk off to this pharmaceutical company and then they will remove this anti-blood clotting factor, purify it, and send it off to hospitals. A second example, also with goats. I like goats, I think they're cool. Here we have a company that has taken the gene that spiders use to make spider silk. And they've done the exact same thing as we just talked about. They've taken that, They've added a promoter, an on-off switch, that's only turned on within the udder of the cow, or in this case, goat. And they've taken that and then put that into the zygote of the goat. It grows up into a goat that has this gene and this promoter in every single cell in its body. But remember, the promoter is only turned on within the udder. And that's because within the cells of the udder, we have the transcription factor, the protein that binds to that promoter and allows RNA polymerase to bind and allows that gene to be active. So very clever, we have now a spider goat. Now it looks like a normal goat. It's like a normal goat in every way, but its milk contains some of this spider silk protein, which can then be extracted. The reason this is so important is spider silk is remarkable. It's very, very strong. It has incredible tensile strength. So it's stronger than steel, actually, for its width. 
and we can make some amazing things out of that. Uh, we could make Kevlar vest type stuff, but we could also make uh, surgical thread that would be very, very strong. One more example, a Canadian example here. Again, a fairly early example. This stuff has progressed further than this. Pigs and other livestock, uh, like cows, can be quite problematic environmentally. So they produce a lot of waste, of course, and that waste contains a lot of phosphorus and also nitrogen. That waste, if it washes into streams and rivers and ponds and lakes, it causes a lot of algae to grow. And then when the algae die, the bacteria that feed on them suck all the oxygen out of the water and the fish die. So we want to avoid this. We want to avoid a lot of phosphorus and also nitrogen getting into waterways. And one way to do that is to change what the pigs release in their waste. So here's an example where researchers have taken a gene for an enzyme known as phytase and they've added that to pigs. It's only going to be produced within the digestive system and it changes the phosphorus content of the manure that they produce. There's much less phosphorus. The farms are more environmentally friendly. So far, we've been talking about changes that you can make in the DNA of a zygote. If you do it in the zygote, then those changes will end up in every single cell of the adult. Now keep in mind, you can attach a specific promoter, an on-off switch, that will only be active in a certain tissue. Now we can also alter the DNA of adult organisms. The problem is there, we have to do this one cell at a time still, so we're not gonna have much of an effect unless we alter the DNA in some sort of stem cell. And a stem cell is a cell that gives rise to lots of other cells. So for instance, there are stem cells in your bone marrow, in the middle of your bones, your long bones, that give rise to new blood cells. For some genetic blood disorders, if we modify enough of those stem cells in the adult, we might alleviate a lot of the symptoms and problems. So here, we're seeing an example where we have a gene that's not working, it's broken, the sequence isn't quite right, and we can identify that, remove that, and put the proper gene in. So we would collect a sample from the patient, and then take out those cells and grow them in culture in the lab, modify the genetic code of one of those cells and grow that up, and then take that and put it back into the patient. A rather new and powerful way of doing this is something called the CRISPR system, which unfortunately we don't have a lot of time to talk about in detail. But this consists of using an enzyme that was originally discovered in bacteria. It's actually an enzyme that bacteria use to identify harmful foreign genes and fight them. But anyway, what this enzyme does is it carries with it a piece of genetic code. It carries with it a piece of RNA. And you can modify this enzyme and put whatever sequence you want in there. That RNA is used as a template to recognize a piece of DNA that needs to be removed. And we can also alter this enzyme in such a way that it will not only remove a certain piece of DNA, but we can also modify it so that it will insert a new piece of DNA. So we can use this enzyme to identify a problematic piece of DNA, a very specific gene, for instance, or a specific promoter, remove that from the cell, and as I mentioned, we can also use the system to insert a new piece of DNA, a new sequence at that exact spot. With gene therapy, we are changing specific genes in an adult organism, or at least an organism that is not fully grown. And we are kind of limited in what we can do. We have to target stem cells that give rise to specific populations of cells. Let's switch gears entirely and talk about genetically modified organisms, GMOs.
and genetically modified food, which falls under that umbrella. So what we're talking about here is tweaking genes in food crops, maybe adding in new genes or, or perhaps removing a gene to enhance growth rates and enhance sometimes flavor of the food, uh, sometimes it's shelf life, etc. Certain strains of tomatoes are among the very first crop plants that were approved for consumption by the general public. We have here a flavor saver tomato, which is a tomato that has been modified to make it juicier and a bit more tangy and flavorful. Another really well-known example would be a GMO that was produced by Heinz, the company that makes ketchup and other things. They, of course, want their ketchup very, very thick, and they were looking for a way to do that with minimal work, minimal prep work. So they actually came up with a tomato that produced a very viscous, thick ketchup all on its own when it was just simply mashed. What they did was they identified a protein, a glycoprotein, that allowed the tomato juices to gel, and they just introduced extra copies of that gene. So they didn't actually change anything or introduce something brand new. They just took a gene and they made multiple copies of it and shoved it back in to the zygote that became the plant. The plant produces more of that glycoprotein. Its juices naturally congeal more and give you thicker ketchup. Again, just to be clear, when we're talking about genetically modified food, we're talking about a modified plant or animal that's going to be consumed as food where we have altered a gene or added extra copies of that gene or removed the gene or modified the gene. Now, I'm going to play an advocate here for genetic modification. I'm not completely, um, and I'll talk about that more in a moment but i know everyone hears the word genetically modified food and they're instantly afraid of it and they think it's some frankenstein thing and i just want to give you the whole picture so you can make up your own mind when these kind of modifications are done the people that are doing it have to know a lot about the gene and its function first so we have typically a company or maybe it's a university or something like that but this entity wants to change something in the plant to improve it in some way or change something in the animal to improve it as a food source for humans. They have to target a gene. They have to figure out what gene is going to change the trait they're interested in changing. They have to identify that gene. They have to study it and know exactly what it does. And then, of course, they can manipulate that gene. So there is a lot of research that goes into this ahead of time, and the outcome is well understood. Uh, that's not the case in traditional agriculture, as we'll see. Humans have been involved in agriculture, growing crops, domesticated crops, domesticated animals, for about 10,000 years or so. And over that time, we have changed things greatly. Most of the crops that we rely on and most of the animals that we consume do not resemble the animals and plants they came from. They have changed immensely. And the reason they've changed is because of selective breeding or artificial selection. So let's say you have a certain plant and there's something you like about it and you want to enhance that. Well, what you do is you take the individuals that have that trait, you only let them breed, and you do this generation after generation. And after a while, you get big changes. All of the crop plants that we eat are all bizarre mutants of the natural plants that came before them. And when we do this kind of artificial breeding, we really don't know what we're selecting for. And we're selecting for random changes in hundreds or even thousands of genes. 
and we're not screening for any of that, we don't know what the consequences are. Now, I'm not trying to say that, you know, domesticated plants and animals are bad food sources, but I'm just saying, think about that and how untargeted this approach was. We're having the same effect. We're changing DNA sequences. We're just letting nature randomly do it and we're picking the ones we like, but the outcome is, is the same. We're changing information. We're directing that change, but at least with genetic modification, we're doing it one gene at a time and we have a better sense of what's happening. And just an example here. So corn, a really important crop, probably a lot more important than you think because it's the major source of fructose, which is a major sweetener that we use in all sorts of things. We get way too much fructose. But anyway, corn is an incredibly important crop and corn does not look anything like its natural ancestor. So on the left, you're seeing what is thought to be a natural corn plant that was discovered originally in South America, and it would have just a few kernels on it. And people noticed that sometimes plants would pop up that had mutations and they had more kernels and they would pick those and they would try to find another one and they would mate them and then the offspring would have that trait. And then they'd keep doing this until they got this really weird corn plant that doesn't look like anything in nature. I think maybe the best example of this is the brassica family of plants. That would include broccoli and cauliflower and kale and Brussels sprouts and kohlrabi and cabbage. They all come from a small little weed. It's wild mustard. And that's what you're seeing on the left. It looks nothing like any of those plants. But that was the plant, the natural plant that gave rise to all of these. So for instance, people decided they wanted all the leaves packed closely together. So they looked for plants that didn't produce stems properly. There were weird, weird mutants that couldn't survive on their own. The leaves were all packed together and the stem was very, very short. For broccoli, broccoli is a big flower head. We've got a plant here that produces way too many flowers and they never mature, they stay green. Cauliflower is the same thing. It's a big flower head, a bizarre mutant, where not only are there too many flowers and they're packed together, but also there's no pigment. There's no chlorophyll within the flower head. And kohlrabi and Brussels sprouts, I think Brussels sprouts are kind of evil, not my cup of tea. I think they taste pretty terrible. But anyway, apart from that, uh, all of these things are weird, bizarre mutants of a plant that looks nothing like what we see today. Again, I'm not trying to push any kind of agenda. I just want to give you the big picture so you can make your own informed opinion. It's worth considering that with only a few exceptions, some nuts and berries and things, most of the foods that we eat, all the big crops, the major crops, are all very weird. All of those plants are very different than the plants they came from. And a lot of the animals that we eat are quite different from the animals they naturally came from. So is modifying lots of genes, knowing nothing about what they do, and again, we're not modifying them directly, we're modifying them by selecting for weird mutants, is that process more natural and somehow better than manipulating a single gene that we know the function of. It's just something we're thinking about. Now, before we move on, I wanna talk about one more modification that humans have done for quite a long time. It's been very, very common over the last 50 years or so, and that's creating seedless fruits. So fruit is a structure that contains seeds and packed around that is sometimes some yummy, tasty uh, flesh that we can eat as well. Bananas, the bananas that you get in a supermarket are not natural. They've been created artificially through selective breeding, deciding which bananas get to breed with which bananas. Now, this is not a case of genetic manipulation per se, because we're not modifying genes directly. Instead, 
we're playing around with ploides. So in the top picture there, you are seeing a natural banana. And down the bottom there, you can see a comparison between a natural banana and a store-bought banana. A natural banana is full of seeds. And the seeds are big and crunchy. And from what I understand, eating one of these bananas is not especially pleasant. But of course, the bananas that we buy in the store do not have seeds. If you look very closely, they have tiny little black dots, and those are aborted seeds. So how did they make these? It's the same process for seedless watermelons as well. What they did was they found two very closely related species in the case of bananas. One was diploid, which is what we would expect. The other one was tetraploid, it was 4N. Plants are weird that way. There are different species of plants and uh, subpopulations of plants that have different ploides. But anyway, remember that mitosis conserves the ploidy number and it can occur with any ploidy whereas meiosis always cuts the ploidy in half so we have these two different species very very closely related one of them is diploid 2n one of them is tetraploid 4n the diploid plant produces haploid gametes as we would expect and incidentally in a plant a flowering plant like banana the pollen contains a sperm cell, two sperm cells actually, and then we have the female portion of the flower that contains an egg, and that egg is contained within a structure called, called an ovule, and that ovule becomes a seed. But anyway, we have female and male parts, and for the diploid plants, they produce haploid gametes, but for the tetraploid, the 4N plants, they produce diploid gametes. If we mate these plants together, we end up with a zygote that is 3N. It's triploid. Now it survives just fine. It's got three copies of the information. That's okay. That causes problems in animals, but not in plants, generally. And that will develop through mitosis into a full-grown plant, a banana plant in this case. Now what's interesting is a triploid, a 3N plant, cannot undergo meiosis. It can't produce gametes. We can't have 1.5N gametes. That's not a thing that would work. We have to have a whole number when it comes to ploidy. So even though that 3N plant is healthy and it will survive, it will not produce seeds. The seeds abort early in development. So the uh, gametes, the egg within that ovule that gives rise to the, to the seed, that egg never develops. So we end up with these little black specks, which would have become seeds, but they don't. And we also end up with a lot more flesh in the bananas. So the bananas are much bigger. Genetically modified foods do hold a lot of promise. And at least that was the viewpoint back in the 90s and, and the early 2000s. Things have changed a bit, and it's mostly due to a change in public opinion. So going back to an early example in the early 2000s, there was this idea presented to create what was called golden rice. And now this is something that was done by a big biotech company. And the idea was to introduce a gene that would create beta carotene. So this is something that's used to make vitamin A into rice. And rice don't usually have this gene. So if you eat normal rice, you do not get this very important vitamin. But with this modified plant, you would get vitamin A. And the reason this is really important is in many poorer countries, uh, many countries in Africa, for instance, there is a big problem with getting enough of this vitamin. Rice is quite cheap, so rice is kind of a staple of the diet, but it doesn't contain that vitamin A, and a lot of people that are living in poverty can't afford foods that would have significant levels of vitamin A. It's something we take totally for granted where 
where we live. But anyway, this seems like a great idea. We could introduce this gene that would make the precursor to, to vitamin A, and we could put that into rice, something that everyone is eating, and we could solve a major health issue. But this project stalled, and it's still stalled, uh, even though you know this has been going on for a long time. It's an ongoing uh, drama. There's a lot of issues here. There were some issues getting this to work properly, so that's the technical side of things. But there was also a lot of issues with public acceptance of this. And some of them are founded and some of them not so much. Like mentioned before, people hear GMO, they immediately dismiss it as terrible. This was uh, a human humanitarian effort. Uh, it was an effort to make money as well, but it did have a legitimate focus. One of the other problems is when you have a company that spends years and years and years developing something like this, of course they don't want other people to steal it. And if you produce a rice that has this special quality to it, other people are going to want to just take your rice and grow it and sell it on the side. So we get into a lot of copyright issues. The company actually put a copyright on this particular plant. Should you be able to copyright life? That's a big ethical issue. It's a little bit beyond what we can talk about right now, but that gets pretty tricky. And also these companies developed monopolies. Now we have this special rice. You have to buy it from us and it gets more expensive as that happens. And also it pushes all the competition aside. So a lot of the major concerns were ethical and financial um, and just what kind of impact this would have on society but not so much a health risk remember you can eat dna it doesn't matter what the sequence is the dna itself is not harmful monopolies are a big concern when it comes to genetically modified organisms and i'll give you a classic example here so a monopoly is where a company comes in and they take over a certain business, a certain segment of the economy. So think of like Apple and Microsoft, they control you know, most of the computer stuff that's out there and Apple controls a, a lot of the hardware. So when you have these big massive companies come in, they limit the choices that people have and then they can increase the prices that they're charging because people don't have any other choice. And the same kind of thing can happen with these wonder crops, you know, the, these crops that can do these special things. A really good example would be something made by Monsanto. Monsanto is a big biotech company. They're all around the world. They're in Canada as well. And they started out developing chemicals. So they developed Agent Orange, which was used in the Vietnam War, unfortunately, not great for their reputation. But they also developed a very, very popular herbicide known as Roundup. A herbicide is something that kills weeds. Now, this is something that's harmful to crops as well, because they're plants, of course. And they developed strains of plants that had been genetically modified that were resistant to Roundup. So a farmer could have those special crops with that one special gene that made the crops resistant, could spray Roundup, kill all of the weeds that were competing with the crop plants, but not damage the crop plants at all. And this is a, a great solution. You can actually use less pesticide. This is a pesticide that weeds are very sensitive to, and you get greater yields. You get more food from your land. Now, the company sold both of these things, the plants and the chemicals, so they developed a monopoly and they went out of their way to protect their monopoly as well. So the seeds for these Roundup Ready soybeans, for instance, and they had Roundup Ready corn, etc., the seeds were modified in such a way that when you were sprouting them, germinating them, you had to give them 
something extra or the plants would not germinate, they would not grow. So basically you had to commit to Monsanto to get your growth factors, to get your pesticide, to get your plants. And this was something that was fairly expensive and it put uh, poorer farmers at a disadvantage. And I mean, that's what typically happens in a free economy. It's not a course on the morality of capitalism, but this is one of the things, of course, that has given genetically modified organisms and genet genetically modified crops a, a really bad name. Let's take a quick look at a few more very odd genetically modified organisms. And you might be scratching your head as to why people did this. Going back to the fish that we started with. So there are these glowfish that you can buy and they are zebra danios, they're called. This is a very common tropical fish that uh, uh, you know people have in aquariums. But these ones have a single gene that's been added that codes for a protein that will glow if you expose it to UV light. So if you put a black light on these fish, they will glow pretty colors. And there are at least three different genes from three different types of jellyfish that give us three different colors. So you can have uh, glow fish that are green, glow fish that are red, glow fish that are yellow. Now the reason this was originally designed is really quite weird. What they did was they designed these fish as a way to test water quality. So they took a promoter, remember that's an on off switch, that would normally turn on a gene that helps cells that are being poisoned. But they took the promoter, the on off switch from that gene, and they attached it to the fluorescent protein gene. So now if the fish were under stress from environmental toxins, they would turn on the gene that would make them glow. So as we've discussed before, this is something they'd have to put in the zygote. And that means that this promoter attached to this particular gene would be found in every single cell and the fish would light up if it was exposed to toxic water. So you could take, a bucket of these fish with you out to a pond, take some of that pond water, dump the fish in, expose them to UV light, and if they glowed, that meant that the water was not good. This seems like a really weird way of doing things. There's much easier ways to do things, but it was a neat little test that just showed what could be done with this kind of technology. Uh, it wasn't that useful for that. Again, there's easier ways to test the quality of water, but it turned out to be rather useful for fish enthusiasts. Um, people you know, wanted these fish. The other example I have here on the right is of a, a rabbit that will glow green under ultraviolet light. So this rabbit looks like a totally normal rabbit. It's white. And if you put it under black lights under UV light, it will glow green because it has this green fluorescent protein, GFP it's called. It has a gene for that in every single cell. And this gene came from, from jellyfish. For the rabbit, they would have taken the gene for green fluorescent protein from a jellyfish, inserted that into a zygote, and the rabbit would have had that gene in every single cell of its body, although it just expressed it, turned it on within the skin, uh, within the epidermis and dermis and the structures that gave rise to the hairs. It's strange that that was done as an art installation. It was done to actually call attention to the powers of genetic engineering. Similar things have been done by researchers with all sorts of organisms. And in the beginning, again, it was just to show that this could be done. So here we are seeing a couple of plants that glow in the dark and they glow in the dark because they have an enzyme that's normally found in fireflies. It's found in their butts, makes their butts light up. It's an enzyme that breaks down a colorless precursor into something that glows and gives off light. If you provide these plants with that precursor, 
they turn it into this glowing substance. And you might wonder why on earth would you do that? Well, again, originally it was done just to show that we understood how the code worked, how promoters worked. We, we understood that this is something we were capable of and we were just demonstrating that knowledge. But fluorescent proteins like green fluorescent protein, GFP, do serve critical roles in research, in medicine, in the study of development, in all areas of biology, these proteins have proved to be very, very helpful. What you're seeing here is a young rat that has developed cancer. We're seeing areas where the green fluorescent protein is being produced and also a red protein as well. And we can see areas that are kind of lit up by this green fluorescent protein. And those are the cancerous areas. Those are developing tumors. What they did is they engineered a rat that had the green fluorescent protein attached to a promoter. Remember the promoter is an on off switch, but the promoter came from oncogenes. Those are genes that are turned on or turned off when they shouldn't be and cause cells to divide uncontrollably. So to test that these promoters were actually doing what we thought, they engineered, again, this rat that had these promoters attached to this protein. And sure enough, those promoters were used in cancerous cells and they lit up these areas of the rat. Although not technically genetic engineering, let's have a quick look at cloning and also the importance of stem cells. Now cloning is used in a few different ways in biology. We talked about the fact that if you make copies of a piece of DNA, like a gene for instance, we might say that we cloned that piece of DNA. But when most people talk about cloning, they're thinking of cloning an adult animal. Cloning does occur naturally. If you have house plants and you've ever propagated them by taking cuttings, so you cut part of the stem or maybe part of a leaf, and then you grow that as a new plant, that is technically cloning. We're starting with a fully grown organism. We're taking a piece of it and we're making a now separate identical individual. Identical twins are essentially clones of each other. So what happens with an identical twin is that we have an egg, just one, being fertilized by a sperm, as would normally happen, giving rise to a zygote. And then that zygote splits into two separate cells. And now each of those cells serves as a zygote and they each give rise to a separate individual. Those individuals are gonna be genetically identical. They're also going to develop in the same environment, so in the same uterus at the same time. So they will be very, very similar. Non-identical twins, incidentally, occur when we have two eggs being released at once. And within the uterus, each one is fertilized by a separate sperm. So they grow and develop together, but they're gen genetically very different. In artificial or laboratory cloning, you're taking the information from a single adult cell and you're using that to create a new individual. You would start with an undifferentiated or unspecialized cell, if you can. So you might use a cell like a skin cell, or maybe a cell from the lining of the stomach, or a cell from the lining of the udder, if we're talking about an animal that has an udder. Next, what you want is an egg cell. You're gonna take an egg cell and you're going to remove or destroy the haploid nucleus that's in the egg cell. Once you've done that, once you have this empty egg, you can take the diploid nucleus from your unspecialized cell and you can pop that into the egg. And basically what you've done is you've turned that egg 
into a zygote. And then you can implant that in a surrogate mother and it will develop into an embryo, into a fetus, into a new adult, if all goes well. What you're seeing on the pictures here, in the bottom right, we have a man named Ian Wilmot, and he's the guy that was the first person to clone a mammal. He cloned Dolly the sheep, which you might have heard of. I actually had the opportunity to, to meet him and talk with him. Uh, he's quite the fascinating man. And we talked about frogs a bit, because in frogs, cloning is not something that's been achieved even to date. It's quite interesting. People have taken skin cells from frogs, done the same thing, introduced them, introduced the nuclei into uh, frog eggs and tried to grow that up. And they end up with an embryo that develops into a tadpole, but doesn't develop beyond that. Frogs and other amphibians are fascinating because they develop twice, basically, once into a tadpole and then they metamorphose into the adult. And it would appear that when you take uh, a nucleus from an adult frog, some genes that need to be used in that second tier of development have been permanently shut off and this doesn't work. But anyway, I kind of got off on a tangent there. This is something that has been achievable for a couple decades now. And we've cloned sheep and cats. That cat there in the beaker is cleverly known as copycat, which is pretty funny. But this is something that's widely used in agriculture to clone very important, very uh, valuable cattle and other livestock, for instance. Dr. Ian Wilmot went on to clone some more sheep just to prove that this wasn't a one-off thing, that he had this protocol down pat. And the next sheep was Polly and then Molly and then Holly. Who says biologists don't have a sense of humor? Anyway, what you're seeing here is the general process that he used. So he had a donor sheep. That's where the cell is going to come from, the nucleus that we're going to use to clone information. And that sheep was a white-faced sheep. We had a second sheep that would supply the egg. And this sheep was noticeably different. So the same species, but a different strain, a different breed. And this sheep had black legs and a black head. Now he took the egg cell from the egg cell donor and knocked out the nucleus. So you can actually pick it out very carefully with a very fine needle, or you can irradiate it to destroy it. But once he had an empty egg, he took the donor nucleus from a cell from the lining of the uh, udder in the white faced sheep and added that to his empty egg cell. Now he has a zygote. The zygote was developed in the lab into an early embryo, just a ball of cells. So the zygote divided into two cells, four cells, eight cells, etc. That ball of cells was then implanted into the uterus of a third sheep. And this sheep also had a black head and black legs. The lamb that resulted, so the baby sheep that resulted, looked like the sheep that we got the donor nucleus from. It did not resemble the sheep that supplied the egg cell. It did not resemble the surrogate mother either. That's why we're using these two different types of sheep, just to ensure that the sheep we got out was the same as the sheep we started with. And sure enough, they did testing to show that the genetic material was identical. Cloning presents some fascinating and very beneficial possibilities in agriculture, medicine, and other fields. However, there are some legitimate fears that come from this new technology.
And I should mention at this point, it's not that new. It's almost 30 years old. Now, cloning humans is, of course, of great concern. Most countries have outlawed this sort of research. There are a few organizations that have in the past claimed to have cloned people, but they have not allowed any testing to be done, and they're probably false claims. Now, cloning of, like I said before, livestock, etc., has occurred, and cloning of pets has occurred. If you have a lot of money to spend and you lose your pet, you might be able to have it cloned. Now, of course, it won't be the same dog. It won't have the same memories. It will look just like that dog. But here's an example in South Korea, a lab that uh, used to, I'm not sure if they still exist actually, but they did used to provide this service. They would clone your dog for you. I mentioned Copycat before, and here she is all grown up on the right in this photo. She was the first cat to be cloned. The cat on the left is the cat that provided the genetic material, and you would expect them to look identical, but they don't. The researchers that did this made perhaps a rather silly choice when they chose the cat that they were going to clone. The cat on the left is very clearly a calico. And if you remember, there's two genes involved in the coloration of calico. There's one I didn't talk about very much that's called the piebald gene that uh, is responsible for the white patches. I won't worry about that too much. But then I talked about another gene that can give rise to black or orange coloration. And remember, that gene is on the X chromosome. Remember dosage compensation? That's where during development, certain X chromosomes are turned off. So in every cell, one of the two X chromosomes will be turned off, condensed and shut down so that we can get the proper amount of proteins being produced from the genes on the X chromosome. What they did here was they took a cell, a single cell, where the X chromosome that contained the allele responsible for the orange color had been shut down. And then they took that nucleus and they put that into an egg cell to create their zygote. And as the zygote developed, that pattern was maintained. That X chromosome with the allele responsible for the or orange coloration was shut down in all the cells that descended from that zygote. And so we have a cat on the right that is not using that orange allele because every single cell contains a copy of the orange allele on the X chromosome that shut down. As we've discussed before, one of the largest ethical and moral issues surrounding genetically modified organisms is that you can copyright these organisms. It makes sense that you would be allowed to do so. Developing a new organism by inserting a gene or removing a gene or modifying a gene, that does take a lot of work and resources. And of course, you want to maintain that copyright and not have people just breeding these organisms and making their own copies. Quite often, organisms that have been genetically modified are sterile. They're sterilized in some way before they are sold to prevent that. Important genetic individuals might also be cloned to create more copies of them. And this might be done on different individuals to create a breeding population. What you're seeing here is an example of an organism that has been genetically modified and then sold as a sterile um, individual to the, the public. So this company, Alerca, and this company doesn't exist anymore. They've, they've gone under, but this is a, a screen capture of their original website. They developed a non-allergenic cat. 
So they discovered that most people that are allergic to cats are allergic to a specific protein. And this protein is actually produced in the saliva of the cat and then the cat will lick itself, it gets on its fur. They found the gene that codes for this particular protein and they knocked it out, they broke it, they deleted it within the cat. So within the zygote of a cat. They grew that up into an adult cat and they cloned that cat and then they started selling these cats for, for quite a lot of money. The cats were of course neutered or sterilized before they were sold so that customers couldn't simply breed their own hypoallergenic kittens. Another really interesting application of cloning relates to extinct animals. What you're seeing here is a Tasmanian tiger. You're seeing a stuffed one on the left and you're seeing the last known photo of the last known Tasmanian tiger on the right. This was kind of a dog or fox like critter, but it was a marsupial. It had a pouch like a kangaroo. We have lots of stuffed animals. We have tissue samples, etc., from these Tasmanian tigers. And it might be possible to actually clone them. Now, what we have to do first is collect all the DNA, get the entire genome. These cells have been dead for quite a while. The DNA is broken up into pieces. We basically have to fit the genome back together. It's going to be kind of a puzzle, but perhaps that could be put into the empty egg of a similar organism. And then a similar organism could also serve as a surrogate. And perhaps it's possible to bring back recently extinct animals like this one. Finally, I want to talk very briefly about stem cells and why you hear so much about them in the news, why they're so important. You started out as one cell, the zygote, and that cell had the potential to give rise to the hundreds of different types of cells that make up you as an adult. You have over 300 different types of cells. They all do specialized things, but you have things like skin cells and liver cells and muscle cells and blood cells and, and nerve cells. The very highly specialized ones, nerve cells would be the best example, can't divide once they reach maturity. They don't typically divide to replace cells that are lost around them. So a nerve cell that's damaged in your central nervous system, in your brain or spinal cord, might be able to repair itself if that dam damage isn't too severe. But if that cell is completely lost, the cells around it aren't able to replace it. As you grow into adulthood, you still maintain some cells that have a fairly broad potential. So for instance, within your marrow, within the red marrow of long bones, things like the humerus and the femur and so on, you have a population of cells that can give rise to blood cells, but they can't give rise to the other cell types. And you unfortunately do not have stem cells as an adult that can give rise to nerve cells. But imagine if you could take a cell, an adult cell, take out the nucleus, use that to create a zygote and let it develop into an embryo. If you took that cell from you to start that embryo through the cloning process we've talked about, then that embryo would be identical, genetically identical to you. It would contain embryonic stem cells that have the potential to become anything. And you could grow up new nerve cells. So again, imagine you have a nerve injury. You have an injury to the spinal cord, let's say, that results in paralysis. Your body cannot regrow those lost nerve cells, but take a nucleus, from one of your cells, put it into an empty egg cell, grow it up into an embryo, and now we have cells that we can tell to become nerve cells and replace the lost ones. So this is a rather active area of research, a rather important area of research.
we've come to the end here and our concepts i'll let you read through those on your own i'm sorry if there was a, a big loss of quality in the audio but uh, i am actually traveling and had to record this on a different microphone some more concepts, again, just kind of rehashing and summarizing what I rambled on about before. And finally, our terminology. Our last slide for our last class in Biology 103. Hopefully you found this series of classes interesting, and hopefully it'll help you interpret what you see on YouTube and what you see on the news and what you read about. The idea of this course is to help you interpret biology and uh, make sense of it and make your own opinions.